Before we get started, if you haven't heard, friend of the channel, Devin Tracy, aka Atheism is Unstoppable, after two long years, has gotten his YouTube channel restored. He filed an appeal, he won the appeal, two years later, over two years later, and now he's back up on YouTube. So if you've missed his videos or whatever, go subscribe to his channel. It will be linked in the description. Also, I'm on Rumble. I'm on Odyssey. I'm on Apple. I'm on Spotify. All over, all different platforms, all linked in the description. Please check it out. But without further ado, let's get into today's video. So over the past couple of months, I have been giving the Young Turks credit where deserved in their flip on crime. I've talked about how they have moved against the progressives and I'm all here for it. Anytime somebody moves closer to my position, this is what I said, I'm happy that they've moved closer to my position. But the thing is, that's really not true. The thing is, that's not something that I genuinely believe because you know what really bothers me more than anything? Somebody who agrees with me and is also incredibly sloppy and incredibly wrong. Somebody who disagrees with me, they're wrong about everything, great, awesome, stellar. I get to make fun of them, we all get to laugh, we all get to pop a beer, we all get to have a good time. However, Anna Kasparian recently dropped an op-ed in Newsweek of all places talking about how progressives need to stop gaslighting on the issue of crime. And while I love the spirit, while I am supportive of Anna Kasparian in this regard, it took two paragraphs for me to find something unbelievably crazily wrong in this article. But before we get into that, this video is sponsored, so let me throw it to the sponsor, two-handed toss with the throwing motion right there, then we'll bring it back over here and we'll discuss everything on the other side and you'll enjoy it or else. Are you aware that the aging process really starts to set in at age 25? You actually lose about 1% of your collagen per year, and if you want to test whether or not you're losing it, try pinching your skin. If it bounces back right away, then you're good, but if not, which is most likely, then you might be in need of a supplement. And luckily for you, I'm partnering today with liquidgoldajw.com. This amazing collagen powder has five different types of key collagens in order to help you restore the youthful glow combined with turmeric which has also been shown to help aid in reversing the aging process and luckily for you you could try this amazing formula for 51% off at liquidgoldajw.com 60 day money back guarantee so Anna dropped this article on Newsweek it is an op-ed as I said it says my fellow progressives we need to stop gaslighting on the issue of crime there's a nice photo of Anna Kasparian right there you can see that she wrote it and I'm happy that she's doing this however I do want to point out that the progressive position essentially in the United States of America is in fact to deny crime. So what Anna Kasparian is actually saying is that Oh, so you said that it was a white guy. What happened? She's moved away from the progressives on the issue of crime. This is a losing issue for the left. She actually regrets some of the ridiculous positions that she's taken about the criminal justice system. However, she can't accept that she's breaking with the progressive mold. So she's trying to reel you guys in on the practical argument even though, as we talk about a lot of times in terms of policy, it really isn't about practicalities or anything like that. It's about emotions. People feel like the criminal justice system is evil, bad, and racist. Therefore, they're going to be against it, and some of them are going to embrace stupid slogans like defund the police or abolish the police. So Anna is going to try to make a logical appeal to people who are responding illogically, which is kind of ridiculous considering Anna responds illogically to all the criminal justice stories and they helped fuel the fire that she's now trying to get out. Oh, so you said that it was a white guy. What happened? So she starts off by saying, it's been breathtaking to watch the same Democrats who spent more than two years ordering Americans to trust COVID related data turn around and reject statistics showing a clear rise in violent crime. A crime wave may not be convenient for the party in charge in the countdown to Tuesday's midterm elections, but that doesn't make it any less real. Now, I've talked about on this channel, maybe I was going a little bit tinfoil hat when I did discuss this, about Anna Kasparian using rhetoric that she seems to have obtained from me directly, and this paragraph is a perfect example of her describing the phenomenon of crime denial. Now, I'm not saying Anna Kasparian watches all my videos, even though 
everybody online watches all of my videos, but I do think the one where I defended her is a video that she saw because there's precise verbiage that I use related to criminal justice that appeared in that video and then appeared in Anna Kasparian's explanation of certain issues. Well, first of all, the purpose of jails, the purpose of prisons is to incapacitate the criminals, remove them from general society so that they stop reoffending in general society. Prisons and how they need to be reformed. Like if we don't provide ways to rehabilitate people as they're incapacitated, as they're in custody, Again, it doesn't matter how long they serve behind bars if the environment in which they are being held turns them into hardened criminals. Well, then that's not a justice system. That's not helping anyone. I know that there are some people out there who think, well, the prison system is not about rehabilitation. It's about uh, taking people who pose a threat to public safety, taking them out of that environment and incapacitating them and punishing them. Now, that's neither here nor there, or as the professionals like to say, that's neither nya nor nya, but it is very important to note that this first paragraph, totally in agreement with Anna Kasparian. The FBI's newly released annual crime report, which isn't even complete, estimated that 2021 saw 22,900 murders, bringing the nation's homicide rate to 6.9 per 100,000 people the highest number in almost 25 years. Following a 30% spike in homicides between 2019 and 2020, cities like Philadelphia, New York, Los Angeles broke annual homicide records, and there's been an uptick of other violent crimes like armed robbery and aggravated assault. So this is where I run into problems with people like Anna Kasparian jumping on board to my side of the issue, because this paragraph, while it does have some statistics that are accurate, ends with a premise that is just absurdly false, and it just goes to show you that no matter what side of the issue Anna Kasparian is on, she's just throwing out random crap that she feels that's not backed up by evidence. Now, first things first, the 30% year-over-year increase from 2019 to 2020, which was driven largely by the Black Lives Matter riots that Anna Kasparian supported, is the largest year-over-year -year increase in American history. And the city of Philadelphia, under Krasner, somebody who was supporting by Anna Kasparian and the Young Turks, one of these district attorneys that is actually a public defender that's endorsed by Sean King, George Soros, etc., who refuses to prosecute anybody, did cause record homicides in Philadelphia. That is a fact. They do have a record. Here is the chart. It's an all-time record, and by the way, their population isn't even at peak, so this is an all-time in terms of raw numbers and also per capita homicides. That being said, Anna Kasparian is just dead wrong about New York City and Los Angeles having an all-time spike in homicides. And to give you an idea of how wrong she is, here is a chart all-time of New York City's homicides. You can see in one year in particular, the city of New York actually had over 2,100 homicides. This was the darkest times in the city that I currently live in. And last year, they had around 450 homicides, or 2020, which is the year that we're talking about. 450 is not the same as 2100, Anna. Those numbers aren't even close, and Los Angeles tells a similar story. The big problem that I have with being wrong about something like this when you're advocating for my position is that New York City actually did see a very dramatic increase in homicides post the George Floyd riots in that we went from a city where around 300 murders happened a year, which, by the way, is in a city of 8.5 million. Philadelphia and Chicago beat New York in raw numbers, even though they don't have anywhere near the same population, to a city with 450 murders year over year. And consistently, we were at around 300, a.k.a. New York City was the safest big city in the United States of America by far. So we did have a dramatic increase. I believe the number range is somewhere around 47%, which is the largest year over year increase in the city of New York, maybe in its history, but at least in the modern history of the city of New York. That's a big enough deal on its own. You don't need to inflate that and say that's an all-time record, but Anna Kasparian is too sloppy, so she did. And Los Angeles, by the way, did the same thing as well. So already in the second paragraph, if you care to fact check, you'll find out that Anna Kasparian is one for three in cities with record murders, and that kind of sloppiness is going to end up exposing her 
to a situation where people can dismiss the rest of the article, which will also lead people to dismiss the crime wave that actually is a problem. Now, Anna also puts out a tweet from a guy called Jesse Drunker, don't know of him, and he says this chart is extraordinary because it puts murders back to where they were 25 years ago. Again, it puts it to the range of where it was 25 years ago, not exactly back to where it was 25 years ago, but, you know, I guess to Anna Kasparian, a difference between 7.4 and 6.9 per 100,000 is not that big of a deal, even though statistically, yes, it in fact is. Now, Anna goes on to write that it's no wonder that 61% of all voters, including 8 in 10 black voters, told Pew Research Center that violent crime is a very important issue for their midterm votes. Yet all they get from Democrats is progressive gaslighting. In an interview with MSNBC last week, Governor Kathy Hochul brushed off concerns about public safety as nothing more than a conservative conspiracy to brainwash Americans into thinking they're less safe. Is Governor Hochul under the impression that black voters feel less safe because they're watching Fox News all day? Now, we've talked about that interview multiple different times on the channel. I played the clip where she said that it's a conspiracy. It was on Al Sharpton's program. I'll play that clip for you so you have some context for it. Governor Al, these are master manipulators. They have this conspiracy going all across America to try and convince people that in democratic states, they're not as safe. Well, guess what? They're also not only election deniers, they're data deniers. The data shows that shootings and murders are down in our state by 15 percent, even in New York City, down 20 percent on Long Island, where Lee Zeldin comes from. And hopefully right now, the legend of Zeldin has won the election because this video will be premiering after Election Day. And I am thirty seven hundred dollars richer, not six hundred dollars poorer because I did bet money on on the election in the prediction market. Now, if I'm wrong and she did end up winning, this is your time right now to gloat in the comments. Please leave your messages about how I was dead wrong and I shouldn't have tried because there was nothing for me to believe in ever and we should never invest or have faith or support any causes we believe in because we will always be horribly disappointed, much like how I feel about this article that Anna Kasparian wrote where she turned her position to agree with me but yet I am horribly and shamefully disappointed in the way that she's presenting this information. Now, Anna goes on to say that major crimes with the exception of murder are up in New York City this year, police data show, a 33% jump in robberies, a 58% rise in grand larceny, and a 31% increase in shooting incidents. Now, again, Anna Kasparian's lack of ability to understand context is really betraying her at this time because you can claim that major crimes are up in New York City, except for murders, but in reality, that's not true. Just because murders are slightly down year over year doesn't mean that we don't have a way higher baseline due to the 47% increase in homicides. If New York City, before Kathy Hochul, before criminal justice reform like bail reform, raised the age, less is more, and all these pieces of legislation that she stands by to this day that are making crime worse, were around 300 or under 300 each and every year, and then they jumped to 450, them going down to 445 is not really a decrease. It's an increase. It's just a slight decrease in the new baseline. So Anna, you really need to get better at contextualizing what we're talking about. And again, I refer you to charts related to murder so you can understand how bad things actually are in the United States of America overall, but in New York City specifically. It's not record-breaking, Anna. We're not over 2,100 murders. You're still wrong about that. But it's not a decrease. Since Kathy Hochul has taken office, there's been a clear trajectory of homicide going up. And even if you say that 2020 was an outlier year, the fact that we're stabilizing around where that outlier year was is is not a good thing. We should be returning back to what was normal, and that's not happening. We should be continuing the trajectory downward in terms of homicides, and the exact opposite is happening. Google's comments on MSNBC show. MSNBC show? Really, Anna? Really? How about Hochul's comments on MSNBC, comma, were so woefully tone deaf that she was forced to walk them back in a subsequent interview on New York One in a 180-degree turn reminiscent of another progressive 
forced to confront reality. I never thought I would be the copyright editor for Anna Kasparian in Newsweek, but yeah, it really seems like she kind of plopped this article out there without fact-checking or even doing the spell and grammar check of what she was writing. During a debate last March, Democratic candidate for the LA mayor, Congresswoman Karen Bass, was asked to rate how safe she feels in the streets of Los Angeles. I do feel safe, Bass answered. On a scale from 1 to 10, Bass rated her perception of safety as a 10. That all changed five months later after two people burglarized her home and stole two of her guns. My safety has been shattered, Bass admitted, revising her personal safety rating to a 5 out of 10. Now, Anna goes on to add that the ordeal that Bass experienced was unlawful, yet she was lucky. She wasn't confronted by armed individuals, as many Angelinos have been, in a new trend of follow home robberies which authorities say involve 17 different gangs in the city now look i don't want anyone to be victimized by crimes i don't want anyone to be hurt and i for damn sure don't want anything bad to happen to politicians when paul pelosi was confronted with a crazy person who had political beliefs all over the map was taking psychedelics and went crazy Everybody tried to use that to blame one political party, and I don't think that's healthy for the country. However, it is quite interesting that both in the mayoral race and in the New York gubernatorial race, we're seeing the consequences of woke criminal justice policy, yet the example that Anna Kasparian went with was the example that Bass faced to show her hypocrisy, rather than the shooting that occurred in front of Zeldin's house, which by the way, if those of you who thought that that was staged somehow, that gang shooting, they actually arrested a suspect with the footage that Zeldin turned over to the police. It just goes to show you that a lot of these local politicians and both of these people are members of Congress as they're running for other offices are not safe from the policies that are in effect because they just don't have that level of security. But even though I definitely don't want that to happen and I don't approve of people cheering this on, it is kind of funny that Karen Bass, somebody who is in full crime denial mode, somebody who is going to continue these terrible woke criminal justice policies, is facing the consequences of the policies that she's advocating for. Again, got no praise for it, got no support for it. I don't think we should even talk like that, but there is a level of irony there in the same way, but in kind of the opposite direction as Lee Zeldin being attacked while talking about bail reform in a speech and then his attacker being released same day without any bail. Also, what kind of bothers me here is that Anna doesn't tie this to any particular policy because the state of California has committed to reducing the prison population. The district attorney, who Anna Kasparian has actually been against, Garcon, doesn't prosecute people for thefts, for burglaries. So obviously, gangs have gotten into this because the consequences of this misbehavior are so low and the success rate goes through the roof as the LAPD gets overwhelmed. They also had their budget cut and you know the funding gets restored pretty quickly but when the climate changes around policing and officers retire and you cut recruiting classes it's not like restoring the funding back to normal makes those cops magically materialize. It's not like when you have a district attorney like Garcon who isn't charging the people that are arrested that doesn't demoralize the police. So just returning the dollar number exactly where it was is not necessarily going to heal the situation especially when all the other mechanisms of demoralization are still in place in terms of policing but Anna doesn't really address any of that she just tries to go on to her pitch because in reality a lot of this is practical a lot of this is she has to experience it she has to go through LA and see how dirty and scummy and disgusting it is and she might personally be afraid but a lot of this is electorally toxic and Anna Kasparian is recognizing that it's electorally toxic right now. As a progressive myself, it's been frustrating to see members of my political group drop the ball. Poll after poll shows crime is one of voters' top concerns this election. Yet much like Governor Kathy Hochul, Rep. Bass, progressive activists and politicians have downplayed the crime wave blaming right-wing fear-mongering and conservative media for voters' concern about public safety. Prominent civil rights attorney Alec Karkastianis, Karkastianis Baratheon regularly smears reporters as propagandists for simply reporting on crime statistics. Karkapaka is the founder of the nonprofit Civil Rights Corps that employs as its treasurer the former San Francisco District Attorney Chesa Boudlin, who was evicted from office earlier this year by voters sick of his soft-on-crime approach. 
As homicides were exploding in many parts of the country in summer of 2021, Karskakapakaba argued that what constitutes crime is being determined by people who have a lot of power and money. It's so hilarious to see Anna Kasparian of all people call this out because Anna Kasparian likes to play this Marxist working class versus the elites kind of game. And now she's coming up against somebody who's using that same cookie cutter dumb explanation in order to explain away homicides and Anna's not tolerating it. Yet she doesn't incorporate that mindset into the way that she talks about other issues because she He's not smart enough to see that they're basically branches of the same tree. But the tweets from this person are absolutely hilarious, and Anna includes them in this article, meaning that she was able to find tweets from 2021, but not able to do grammar checks or statistic checks, thus leaving her vulnerable to attacks by the very same progressive she calls out thread. You're going to hear a lot about how cops need more resources because crime is surging in the next few months. It's propaganda, and here's how you can respond. First, what constitutes crime, which is in quotes, by the way, is determined by people who have a lot of power and money. And then in his first quote tweet, it says, A few thoughts about crime. The concept of crime is created and manipulated by people who have power. Throughout U.S. history, powerful people have defined crime in ways that benefit wealthy people and white people. So according to this other buffoon, crime is just what wealthy white people define crime as. And I don't know if you know this, white people are clearly and obviously racist, and wealthy people clearly and obviously hate the poor. So if you're kind of anti-racist but also anti-rich oligarchy, then what you need to do is embrace the increasing levels of homicides that are going on in your community. This is absurd and stupid in every possible way. And it's also important to note that this is incredibly unhelpful to people who are poor and to a lot of minorities. Not all minorities. Some minority groups have lower rates of violent crime than the general population than white people as a demographic. But minorities like black people have higher rates of violent crime, significantly higher, and higher rates of victimization. But more importantly, you can't have economic development without law and order. Nobody's going to want to invest in a neighborhood, open a store, help out the community by actually bringing economic prosperity to that community if things are going to get stolen and there's no consequences for it. If you wanted to fight poverty, the greatest anti-poverty program you could possibly do is lower the crime rate because that lowers insurance premiums that actually attracts big box stores that sell things to the community at cheaper prices. Those stores are more vulnerable to shoplifting due to the fact that their whole business model is selling you a lot of things at low profit margins because they're profiting off the volume they're delivering to you. And if certain amounts of stuff get stolen from that store, they can't function. This is one of the reasons why in bad neighborhoods, you typically see smaller convenience stores that charge higher prices and those smaller convenience stores that charge higher prices are actually less profitable so yeah if you want to fight poverty, if you want to fight inequality, then the first thing you need to do is fight the unequal crime in these neighborhoods because that will lead to economic prosperity. Remember, crime is not caused by poverty. Crime actually drives poverty in a lot of places in this country. And the denial of that, the failure to recognize that, doesn't solve any problem. Essentially, and I know I've said this time and time again, this guy is arguing that all criminals, I don't know if you know this are actually Aladdin. They're Disney's Aladdin, the lead of that movie, who may be riffraff, he may be a street rat, but if you look a little closer, he actually has a heart of gold. If you just give them three wishes, then they will reach economic prosperity, and until then, because they're poor, they're going to sexually assault people at higher rates, because obviously when you have no income, you got to push people into the subway. Meanwhile, last year, progressive Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Anna Kasparian just calling out everybody, similarly minimized concerns about the surge in crime in New York City at a virtual event with Rep. Jamal Bowman, expressing fear that the crime stats were headline-driven hysteria at a time when New York was one of 12 major cities experiencing a devastating homicide surge. 
In reality, the right's messaging on crime is potent because the crime wave is real and it's negatively impacting the lives of the same minorities and working people the left claims to represent. Now again, here's where I give Anna Kasparian credit. She's calling out people that she has previously been well aligned with, that she's previously run cover for, and talking about how the right's messaging on crime is working because the crime wave is in fact real. Now Anna will deny that the solutions that the right proposes are actually working. But the thing is, people believe in those solutions, and when you have the other side talking about how it's just hysteria, nothing to worry about, or saying that crime isn't as bad as it was in the 1990s, that's not really a good sell, because crime doesn't have to be as bad as the worst time for crime in American history for you to be concerned about it. A significant increase, the beginning of a trend, is something that you should head off and address. On top of that, in certain cities in the United States of America, like Philadelphia, who I keep harping on, crime is as bad as the 1990s. Record homicides. Larry Krasner's woke criminal justice policies just from the district attorney's office have driven Philadelphia into the worst period for murders in the history of Philadelphia. That is amazing. It's unbelievable. We talked about the 2,100 murders in New York City in the 1990s and how through a dramatic spike, we've hit 450 in the city of New York, and that's a huge increase. That's a fifth of the record. Philadelphia has passed the record, and remember, the 90s was peak crime nationwide, so it was an overall trend, including in Philadelphia, and they're worse now than they were then. Now, Anna also goes on to talk about how Minneapolis actually put defund the police on the ballot which wanted to replace the police department with a new reimagined version of public safety. And when they actually did the vote, they did the ballot initiative, 56% of voters rejected the proposal, including 78% of black voters. And this is despite the fact that the defund side had about $3 million more spent on this campaign than the pro-police side, the pro-common sense side, the pro-not-insane side. Now, by the way, one of the reasons why black voters in particular are not into defund the police and the Minneapolis poll results actually track black voters voters nationwide is because they feel the brunt of the homicide increase because they're the ones committing the majority of the homicides and you kill people that live in the same areas as you so they're also being victimized we have fbi statistics that show that 12 percent of the population which is the current black population according to the census are responsible for 60 plus percent of the homicides a new record so the homicide spike has occurred in black neighborhoods in particular which is where the police were pulled back from because guess what the police actually do have a deterrent effect on crime and Minneapolis, by the way, which is where the death of George Floyd happened, where this hysteria started, where this poison on our nation actually originated from has record homicides as well so they're worse than the 1990s as well that is the result of black lives matter that is the result of pretending that the police are white supremacists that is ground zero and the reason why is because you have a cowardly mayor who looks like a discount weaker version of trudeau and you had keith ellison as the ag who did everything and anything possible to aid the narrative in order to undercut the institution of law enforcement these are the consequences of that by the way minneapolis also going through outrageous numbers of carjackings and all other problems. And again, this is with an entire city council that voted to defund the police and, by the way, has doubled their budget for their own personal private security. And it's been rejected by a majority of the voters, including nearly 80% of black voters. But we're all supposed to be like, oh, no big deal. We got to move forward. These people just don't know. Copaganda, which, by the way, anybody who uses the term copaganda should actually be criminalized. That's the one speech crime I'm on board for. It's not funny. It's not clever. It's lame as hell. And of course, hysteria related to the record numbers of homicides that they are seeing in Minneapolis. Now, Anna also cites a survey from the Kaiser Family Foundation, which by the way, Kaiser has nothing to do with Kaiser Insurance. A lot of people get mad at me when I cite them in terms of their healthcare polling. They do a good job on polling, and they found that only 17% of black voters supported decreasing police departments funding in their area. And nearly double that amount, 34%, said that they support 
increasing the police budget, but most of them just wanted to keep the funding the same. So we have polling that shows time and time again that about 80% of black voters either want the police funding increased or they want it kept the same, while only 30% of Democratic white voters want to increase the funding or keep it the same. So what we have here are situations where white progressives like Anna Kasparian, college educated people, a lot of them are women by the way, let's be honest about who we're talking about, want to cut the funding of the police in order to save the blacks and all the black people or the overwhelming majority of them, eight and 10, four and five, however you want to break it down, don't want that to happen. And the reason why is because these wealthy white progressives don't live anywhere near the epicenters of crime. They've long moved out of that neighborhood and they're bored with their prosperity. So they decide to fill their time with white guilt. So what we're seeing is white guilt actually leading to the deaths of minorities as these white progressives push and push and push to cut the funding of the police departments, which in a lot of cases are the only things that are holding these communities together. Remember, we have about 20,000 murders in the United States of America, 22,000 according to Anna Kasparian. 60% of them are committed by black people. So we end up in a situation where somewhere there's about 60 to 55% of the victims of those homicides are in fact black people and white progressives who don't really have to experience this, who didn't really experience the large spike in homicides are trying to pull back the police departments in order to save the nine unarmed black people per year that are shot in the United States of America across the whole country. You have places hitting record murders, but white progressives in the United States of America, like Anna Kasparian up until eight minutes ago, are like, you know what? Don't deploy the cops because remember, nine unarmed people get shot in the United States of America a year. Nine unarmed black people, and we got to fight that evil white racism. Now, we talked about, by the way, how these nine unarmed black people that are shot in the United States of America a year include people that don't have a gun, but they go for the cop's gun, include people who are driving a vehicle at the cop so a lot of them are people who are actively trying to arm themselves or trying to kill the officer with another type of weapon which is not technically considered a weapon in certain circumstances according to the Washington Post like a vehicle so we're really letting all these murders occur according to white progressives in order to save like three unarmed black people that still may have been shot justifiably every single year in the United States of America. I've seen the crime wave and the police shortage play out firsthand in Los Angeles, a city where I was born and raised and still live today. Yet when I vocalize my own concerns about crimes, my fellow progressives gaslight me and demand I reject what I've seen with my own eyes. I've been told repeatedly that it's all in my head, even after I was sexually assaulted by a stranger in my neighborhood earlier this year. Now, I was wondering what the spark point was for Anna Kasparian to flip on crime, and it appears that this is the incident. Anna Kasparian, according to her own words, was walking her dog in her own neighborhood when a stranger, possibly homeless, but that's just my speculation, it's weird that it's not included here, grabbed her as she was bending over to pick up her dog's waist, and started aggressively thrusting at her. So Anna Kasparian is attacked in the streets in her own neighborhood, and then you start to understand why she's starting to pivot on this issue, because it's all fun and games to be in favor of criminal justice reform until you are greeted with the vicious consequences of it. And honestly, I'm sorry to Anna Kasparian that she had to go through that. It's not okay. It's not acceptable. It's not deserved because she took political positions. We don't want to live in a society where these crimes can go unpunished. I would be interested into however much she wants to explain this in this guy's previous criminal history, if that had anything to do with it. But it's a horrible situation, and it's shocking because Anna Kasparian has lived in L.A. her whole life, and it appears nothing similar to this has ever happened to her, and that has caused her to give pause to previously stated positions. And the way that the progressives are viciously attacking her just goes to show you how fraudulent Me Too was to a lot of these people. They don't care about this or that allegation. They don't care about this or that event. What they care about is 
is causing problems for people who step up and speak out against their political positions. So in this regard, and statistical errors and all that stuff, we set it aside. We are with her on this, and I hope justice is done to that person. And unfortunately, because they have that district attorney that doesn't prosecute anybody, I don't look forward to the prospect of hearing any good results from this case. Now, Anna goes over a bunch of different stories about different people who are in the working class who are victimized by these criminals, like somebody who's a custodian. She talks about the Park Slope incident where the dog was beaten to death, which, by the way, the woman ended up having to track down the person who beat her dog to death and then she was beaten again by this person because nobody was going to pursue charges against this person because he was just a homeless person so i guess he's entitled to attack women in the park and beat their dogs to death so he ended up assaulting her again re-traumatizing her and a lot of this except for the marxist infused rhetoric is all to the good, and I'm on board with it, and I understand it. So even though Anna Kasparian definitely sloppy at certain points in this article, and we can have fun, she's on the right track enough that if we just get some corrections on the statistics, punch up the accuracy of this, she could actually be a decent advocate for those people who are victimized by criminals. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you like this video, show them by leaving a like, subscribe for more content, follow me on all my social media, support me via the support links in the description box of this video. Full link to the article is in the description box as well. This has been me talking about Anna Kasparian's anti-crime article. Till next time.